Uh, my name is Petr Žilka. Uh, this is Tomáš Jasný, Otto Horší, Roman Tiet and Anna Bolická. Uh, we usually act under pseudonyms, so uh, those are not our real names, but uh, in connection with Tohoven we act under these pseudonyms. So uh, we are very pleased uh, that we could come here and especially to this place because it's connected with uh, uh, many themes and issues uh, that we also place uh, in uh, our activities. Uh, there were uh, uh, Bitnik uh, Median Group before us, uh, which is our uh, very uh, favorite uh, collective. We also had them on our congress we uh, had in Prague. Um, uh, there was Jacob Applebaum, uh, who we invited to our congress for next year. So we have lots of um, common uh, with Axioma. And uh, today we would like to present to you a selection of our work. Uh, it's uh, based on demand of uh, Janes, uh, who uh, told us which, which uh, projects he prefers to be, uh, to be presented. So we will uh, try to show you what it was about, what was the idea behind and how we did it. And then we will be happy to let you ask whatever uh, you want. Uh, we are here to answer all your questions we are able or we can in uh, the contemporary situation. So uh, at the very beginning, uh, couple of numbers. Uh, we, we, have, we were established in 2003 uh, by our first uh, project, the question mark above Prague Castle, which is over there. Uh, we are a multidisciplinary platform, which means that we are basically art collective, but we are open to uh, many different professions and skills, and we uh, try to build our, uh, our uh, let's say, uh, skills and so on 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 different on on, on different uh, backgrounds of our members. Uh, we have eight projects behind us uh, plus two secrets, but I cannot talk about those secrets. So <laughs> those I can talk about are uh, four uh, projects in public space, uh, which were based on some guerrilla uh, strategies. Then we had a live TV broadcast uh, intervention. Uh, we had one institutional uh, intervention, one uh, hack of uh, mobile phones of uh, politicians, and we established one uh, non-profit organization. So, the media reality, it's our third action in a row. What we did, uh, I will try to simply describe it. Well, imagine that around the frontiers of our Czech Republic, around, there are some cameras still live streaming the picture, turn it around, it is uh, for the purpose of uh, weather forecast. Then there is a TV show in the morning and they're just uh, switching the cameras around the frontiers, so it's live screening. Well then, we, we've been, uh, we make kind of like research, what are we able to do with that? Then we, we found that it's possible to hack these cameras, but in the end we found that there was only one which was possible to hack because it was analog, otherwise it was digital, it wasn't possible. What, what we did, we just uh, made uh, kind of like simulation of atomic bomb, uh, just uh, boomed in, a, in a mountains uh, by the frontiers in the Czech Republic, and it was screened in live screening. Here will be some uh, short footage from the, from the moment of the action. Which was at the transmitter station? Yes, it was like analog hacking of uh, transmitter at the place. You can see live broadcast right here, as seen on TV. Mm -hmm.
but it's a classic format of Guerrilla <laughs> DW. <laughs> so here is uh, the screenshots from the footage, as you see. For us as the group, it was really important and breaking project because we made a break, really significant breakthrough to the media worldwide, especially New York Times, I guess. They have dedicated one whole page about this project. And that time we started realizing the power of the media and the media manipulation. In the same time, we actually started working on something we later called uh, media object. We, did, we still didn't know the theory of the media object, but we, already, we were already working on it, and I will come back later as, as the other projects follow. Mm -hmm. There was a big uh, investigation by police, and then they just caught us because of, of our GMS, uh, GSM, GSM uh, location, and then we, we, we stand in front of court, it took a one year in front of the court, and uh, we finally won the case. But uh, the point for us was what was new. Before we we were like anonymous, you know, doesn't use our names. But in front of the court, we just uh, were like identified. So there was this big topic of identification, which which, which become uh, a theme of the next project. Uh, we we were awarded by. National Gallery for this project of uh, atomic bomb, like uh, the price of National Gallery. In the same moment, we went against in front of the court against Czech Republic by a state. So it was like kind of like it was like criminal court schizophrenic uh, situation, let's say. Yes, and then the identity and identification by itself become uh, to be a, a big uh, big team for us. This project took. It was the longest project we have ever worked on. It took almost two years, one year of preparation and another year of actually doing the project day per day. The whole idea was based on how can we actually cheat the state identification of a citizen? How can we actually hack it and break it through? Then one guy of us came with this idea of like, having our faces morphed one to each other, combining the faces of two people, and you create two same pictures of, actually you merge two in, in, in one, and then you can, each of the guys can go and get the identification card with the same picture in it. Here you can actually see all the, all the pictures with the one ID card issued by Czech government, and you were living actually under the name and ID of someone else. That was the experience because we had to live like one year or more, perform all the actions that were based on your ID, like traveling, like voting in the national election, mm -hmm. getting married. This guy actually had his uh, fire gun ID license issued on the fake name. Later on, actually, when, we, when it came out, we came out with the, with the project and showed to the public that what, what have we done for our one year that we have been living under the, someone else's ID. And there was a large opening evening, which was actually closed immediately by police because they came in, because they claimed that all the IDs are fake, that they are not valid, but they actually were valid. So they took everything, they confiscated everything, and again, we were facing the the police investigation mm -hmm. and the court. And the court. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, kind of opening party of our <laughs> 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 of the way we do it. Uh, what was interesting was that uh, at the beginning was a criminal accusation that um, that the, the, this exchange of identity with the group is, is a crime. But uh, finally, they couldn't find any article under which they could sue the group uh, from from some criminal act. So uh, they they uh, they gave it up. The, the the criminal trial has ended, and it was uh, later uh, uh, proceed under under some admi some administrative offense. And uh, finally, I don't know where some f just small fine or. Uh, maybe 
maybe it, it didn't have any result at no all. Result at all. Yeah. Uh, many legal consequences uh, remained. Uh, for example, Roman and Anna are still married, even though they never uh, got married together. Uh, only another member of the collective uh, uh, using Roman, Roman's name. Yeah, used Roman name, and, and Roman identity went to the uh, to the marriage with to the wedding with, with Anna and. They are still actually married and they cannot get divorced because there is no way in Czech law how to divorce these two people. Because no, yeah, there, there is a way to divorce, but uh, they, they ask the state to uh, to state that it's not valid marriage. Okay. But the state is not able to say, okay, this marriage is not valid and uh, we don't consider it as marriage um, since the very beginning. So they, they don't have any legal tool how to do it, so it's, it's still like this. Totally different project uh, uh, from all uh, projects before. Uh, it's called Parapolis. And uh, it's it's, uh, it's project that uh, <coughs> is, is still running. I consider it to be one of the most interesting projects. Uh, uh, we did because it's not any guerrilla intervention. It's not one time, one place when something happens. But it's an uh, institution, uh, and it's inspired by a hacking community, which uh, slowly became part of our group and our activities. And uh, uh, we were very inspired by the idea of. of of uh, hacking, of hacker spaces, how they work. We have started to come to uh, hack, uh, hackers congresses and we, are am we were amazed how these people called hackers, people with ID IT background, uh, see the world in totally different ways than we, but uh, in the same time they share uh, many ideas and many aims and many goals uh, that we have too. And they also work with the world around them, uh, but they use different tools how to how to uh, see it in total different way. And uh, we think that this is something that is common between hacking and art. And uh, we started to take a look at it much closer uh, via establishing our own hacker space, which was the idea uh, uh, at the very beginning. But um, we were searching for some small place like other hacker spaces usually are, you know, some 100 meters uh, small place where you can have some workplace and and place to meet and uh, and share ideas. But then we have found uh, this house which is 1,000 square meters uh, and uh, which has four floors but it amazed us so much that we, we said to ourselves that this is the place where it has to happen and um, since we had so much space uh, and so much uh, so much bigger playground than we had expected our ideas went further and we said to ourselves that it's so selfish to only uh, establish hacker space to educate ourselves, but we should establish an inst institution and bring all those hacking teams and tools and ideas to the public and, uh, and educate everyone who is interested uh, in all those interesting stuff. And uh, that was how, how, uh, how Pearl Police was in, uh, constituted. The main idea behind uh, was um, our shared uh, feeling that authoritarian tendencies in society are growing, that uh, the surveillance it becomes very serious social problem, that states uh, increase regulations and ways they control our lives, and uh, with with the idea of crypto anarchy, which I will talk about uh, later. Uh, we started to discover the idea that the state is maybe not the best solution for future in context of new technologies and decentralization. Because what new technologies bring us is much more uh, freedom that we can enjoy and totally different ways how we 
constitute our uh, social relationships. And maybe in future we, we will find simply better ways how to organize society than, than under the idea of state. So uh, that's why we have established uh, the hackerspace and crypto anarchy freedom think tank. And uh, the tools are obvious. Uh, we have an uh, institution where we educate people, uh, where we create community, where we promote decentralized tools like bitcoins, like, uh, like uh, anonymization tools like Tor, uh, hidden service. And, and um, we talk about encryption, how to protect our privacy, etc., etc. And we also organize an uh, annual congress, which is called Hackers Congress for our Police. The main place for us is the Institute of Crypto Anarchy, <coughs> which is a place where we uh, try to critically talk about decentralization itself as a, as a, as a, as a basic idea of, uh, uh, of hackers uh, and cypherpunks. Uh, which uh, was developed at the, at the break of 80s and 90s uh, when the internet was like a baby uh, developing tool that only a couple of people had, uh, had access to and at the time uh, one a very interesting man called Timothy C. May uh, wrote a crypto anarchy manifesto which became very interesting later uh, like especially after 2009 the reason is that he uh, described in uh, crypto anarchy manifesto some phenomena and tendencies that appear to be real uh, to us uh, in the recent years and Timothy C. May said that uh, anonym anonymized uh, communication and interaction among people on the internet uh, will uh, bring us to state where uh, states won't have any tools how to control these interactions and, and communications. That cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, uh, which was uh, developed in 2009, but uh, it was predicted by Timothy C. May at the, at, the, at the very early 90s, that the cryptocurrencies will become independent way how to create economical uh, relationships uh, worldwide uh, and it's happening uh, that we will have a strong encryption tools to protect our privacy on the internet uh, he predicted that uh, the reputation principle will grow and today uh, all new applications like Uber and Airbnb and eBay and Amazon everywhere you get the reputation principle because once you want to become a seller or a buyer you need a reputation of how how, how good you you act in, in the relationships, and uh, and he also predicted uh, internet free markets, uh, which are well known uh, thanks to Silk Road case. These all uh, quite serious uh, serious uh, phenomena are are really present today, and we established our Institute of Crypto Anarchy to to seriously talk about it as a, as a reality that we cannot stop somehow, that even states cannot stop. And uh, we want to talk about it as, as quite positive possible solution for future. So, uh, so that's why Parapolis was established, but it's not the only part of it, uh, because we want to create a really living community and since we wanted to open all these issues to common people and to provide the opportunity to make the real touch of crypto technologies uh, in real, we established a Bitcoin uh, coffee, which we later realized was the first Bitcoin only coffee in the world, uh, because we don't accept any other currencies than just Bitcoins. Um, that's because we, we uh, said that our concept is to have strictly <laughs> state-free project, which means that we don't accept any, any public funding and we also don't accept any state-controlled uh, currencies like crowns or euros. Uh, then we also have a hub, a co-working space, where everyone interested in our issues can start to work and, and uh, we also have there um, the institute. It's a it's a hall where 
over any lecture or workshop or whatever, or uh, <laughs> this, is a, this is from evening of, uh, of the most bizarre porn. So whatever can happen there. And we also have Maker's Lab, which is a 3D printing lab focused on uh, decentralized production of material stuff, uh, which, which is represented mainly by uh, 3D printing, but uh, also by other technologies we, we, we focus on. Uh, guys in Maker's Lab uh, have uh, lots of other issues. They, they do 3D scanning, they, they are interested in drones, which is increasingly interesting theme and others. And our running project are Red Andes Wafra Castle, where all of us were involved. The idea behind is uh, quite simple. We have President Miloš Zeman, maybe you have heard about him. Uh, Miloš is uh, first directly elected president in Czech history. It seems that the, the, the direct democracy really works because the people who promise the most to other people, if somebody calls them populist, uh, usually win the elections. So uh, thanks to Miloš Zeman we know that, that the, the old school democracy really works and that power freaks who are not ashamed to promise to the people whatever they want, they, they really get to the power. Uh, other team were state symbols. Um, as you heard, uh, we as Parallel Police, we are in, let's say, polemic discussion with, uh, with the state as, as, as some uh, social construct we live in and we try to impose critical questions whether we still really need so much of state uh, as before and whether it's still a good idea for future. So also state symbols, which for somebody are untouchable, uh, we wanted to, to somehow make doubts about it, whether, whether sh they shall be considered to be saint. The idea behind is easy. There is an official uh, seat of Czech president called Prague Castle. And up above Prague Castle, when the president is in, uh, th there is his presidential flag. So what about if we replace the presidential flag with some more fitting flag to our, our, uh, our president Miloš? And then we should actually say, why does it fit to him? Because <coughs> this guy actually He's not ashamed of anything. He goes to the live broadcast interview in the in the yeah. Czech radio, and he swears he used dirty words in the live broadcast, and but nobody does nothing about it. He does such nasty thing as inviting a dictator of China to our country, which is ongoing today, actually, or yesterday, like two or three days. past days. Then. He hasn't any natural enemy because he is his IQ is so high. He is very well educated man, and there is nobody who could actually face him directly and criticize him. So we felt that there is something needed in our country to do. For example, giving the other half of our nation some hope that this guy actually can be criticized, that he can actually be touched by something. Because whatever has been done so far against him, he just turned it upside down into his advantage. So we thought of something so big and so dirty and so powerful that will shame him and his way of shaming the institution of president of a country. So that's why we came with the idea of the huge red panties, the underwear, and we actually took his presidential flag, we climbed up the, the roof of the Prague castle, we chose the Swimney Cheaper costume to be kind of <laughs> um, invisible. <laughs> invisible or fitting to the roof and not creating any, any question before it's really, really needed. And we replaced it with with a, with a huge red panties, and we claim that the presidential flag is something that we keep safe from him, 
because he was actually dirtying what the flag means to the to the nation. And we actually did a lot of planning, observation, and we chose the right hour to climb up. Actually, when three of us were climbing up, there was the rest of the crew all around the crack castle making it sure that nothing will happen to us. Like creating distraction for the soldiers and for the guard of the castle. Maybe it's good to for point out that there was a huge discussion about the castle security. Now you can see the breakthrough to the uh, uh, castle security, which was very much discussed in, in the media afterwards. Here is the rough video of how how real time the vault replacement <laughs> happened. So uh, all, all those three guys that were up on the roof were uh, were arrested. There is still a running interrogation, so we cannot talk about everything. Well, the, the action itself was so intense. The feeling was so intense that I thought it took an hour, you know, to to replace the flag. It was just a few minutes actually, but then. It was infinite to me. I thought it will never end, and I was so nervous, like watching around if anybody is actually going to catch us and climbing up for us. This is a place protected by army and by many, many other, uh, many other security services, and we were really afraid of of the health and even life of guys when they climbed up because we didn't know what will be the reaction. We didn't know whether. Somebody starts shooting when they see that somebody touches the flag or what, what, what will happen. We were actually pretty sure that we will never make it through the police with the data files on the on the memory sticks, you know, cards. So before leaving the construction, we have hidden those memory cards into the tube of the construction. And when we left we were held by, pol by police, the police investigation shown that we had these cameras on, <coughs> they, they couldn't uh, find the memory sticks. They never searched us through, so we could have had it in our shoes or somewhere. But, you know, the question the second day was how to get to those memory sticks, because we were pretty sure that the construction will be already pre guarded pretty well. <laughs> well. <laughs> As you can see, we managed to have one of two memory sticks, from which is this video. And it was thanks to Czech television, actually, who called us, asking us if we could make it possible for them to create a, a reconstruction of the case. You know, how did we enter the construction? How did we do it? And how was it difficult? And as you did, I said to them to the telephone, it was very difficult. I have to show you, you know? You just have to guarantee that you will enter the construction with me and I will show you how to how to make it. So the second day when I came to the to the construction itself, I didn't I, I saw the Czech TV standing around with the camera waiting for me, but I didn't ask them anything. I just went right through the construction the same way we did it the day before. I entered the construction, I started digging into the tubes because I couldn't remember which one of them was, you know, to find the, the final, to get the, cap, the, the memory stick. And in the same time, I was entering the construction through the same gate. There was a guy, there was a police or the Prague Castle guy who started shouting at me like, what are you doing? What are you doing? And he was like running, you know, after the fence. He never entered it. He was like, what, 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 what will I do? Then I entered it, I took the memory stick, I have hidden it in my hair. <laughs> <laughs> then I left the construction. I was you know, taken in immediately again with the same guys who took me in yesterday, <laughs> the day before. They were like, what the fuck is going on with me? And they were actually, in the same time, calling through the radio all the members of the Prague Castle Guard to come that there is another bridge going on. Then immediately all of the Prague Castle Guards, as including the secret ones, you know, the civil ones, were running into one spot just to see me. And I said, so if everybody is here now, 
who is actually taking care of the rest of the broadcast? And then they started realizing, oh, oh my god, okay, stay there, stay there, no, 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 no. <laughs> Well, they didn't find the, the, the memory stick. I spent another three, four hours in the police station and I, I, was, I was let go, so... Uh, what happened after that? Uh, guys were arrested, uh, interrogation is running. There was uh, already one attempt to bring the case to the criminal trial, but uh, the judge stated that all all the proofs are not well done and it must be repeated. So uh, it was returned to the police, and it took them another half year to I investigate everything. And now, about months ago, uh, there uh, there came another accusation. Uh, we are accused of uh, three crimes. Uh, one is death of, of the flag, one is damaging of another's property, and uh, then there is a vandalism. Well, what happened next was that the half of our nation who voted against this president took the red underpanties as a symbol of yeah, kind of rage towards, the, towards our president. So ever since then, you can see the red panties symbol everywhere on the balcony of some flat or on, the, on another chimney in the middle of the Prague. And then people took care of them, took care of it of themselves actually. And they keep actually using the symbol we created with the fight towards this president. What to say finally? Maybe uh, the moral reform. I will just briefly tell you what, is, what it was about. We managed to gather all the telephone numbers of all the parliamentary members of Czech Parliament, including the Czech President, including his, the Czech President's office, and some journalists, some very important journalists connected to Czech politics. Then we created a screenplay where how the idealistic view of dispute in the Czech Parliamentary would look like. Like, if they were all behaving nice to each other, how would it be if they were actually inviting the, uh, the right side of the political spectrum would be inviting the communists over a coffee and discussing their plans? Wouldn't it be nice, right? <laughs> in the idealistic way. So we created this screenplay where each of them is sending an SMS to another one inviting him for over a coffee, telling him that he went wrong before, apologizing, asking him you know, to create plans together and create some reform which would have a moral aspect in it. The only reform that has not been ever performed since our revolution. So <laughs> we managed to create all these small messages and we hacked into their phones and we managed to send those messages to them as if they were actually sending them to each other. So the message on your phone appeared under the name of the, of the other guy. And here is a timeline. Uh, uh, here is a timeline where, where you can go through and you can see all the messages that were sent uh, among the MPs. There are uh, uh, different parties under different colors. Uh, among these these members of, of Czech uh, political establishment, there was a huge exchange of one call to join the moral reform. We started sending them these SMSs, and it took us one hour and something, like one hour and a half or two hours, to send over 600 SMSs, and we could actually watch it live because it was broadcasted live on Czech TV. So in the, in the real time, we was actually seeing the parliamentary members receiving these SMSs, like doing faces, what the fuck, you know, and then we could see it's working, really. They were going out, asking each other, did, did you send it or not, and so on. And when we was uh, asked by one of the major Czech contemporary art galleries <coughs> to participate on an activist um, exhibition. We decided to actually went. We decided to go public with all the the numbers of Czech 
parliamentary members, including the president, letting people sending SMS by themselves to them, what they think, directly to them, you know? <laughs> we actually have a phone installed in front of the big table, and you could use that phone to send the SMS to, to, the, to the politicians. Thank you. Thank you. Uh,